Yeah. Hi, Bob. What is it that can get in the way of our prayers? What stops us from praying? What is it that keeps us from knowing we ought to pray? I'm Pastor Larson, Trinity Lutheran Church in Delray Beach, Florida, and this is our Bible study. Today we want to consider some of the hindrances to our prayers. What hinders us from praying? I'm going to suggest to you that it is sometimes our pride. When we forget that God has ruled over all and that he is worthy of our praise and our and our thanksgiving at all times. So that is our idea as we consider under the general theme, the Lord loves, he loves to hear us pray. Isn't that true? Isn't that true that God Amen. wants us to pray? It sure Amen. is. The Lord loves to hear us pray. Consider today, this hindrance to prayer, when our prayers are not answered, or when we think that God is not listening, does it seem that the Lord has hidden his face? He's hidden his face from us. And our prayers uh, don't seem to reach beyond the ceiling of the room in which we are praying. Is it because, is it perhaps because we have failed to give God the glory. And that's what I want to talk about uh, in the first uh, many minutes this morning. If we have time, and I know how things go, so this is not a promise. <laughs> if today, if not today, uh, then uh, next time, I'd like to consider with you God's encouragement to pray. Because I think we need assurance at times. We need assurance from God that he loves to hear us pray. So how has God opened that door that, uh, that seems to be closed at times, that door which is the true and living way to pray? I'm not asking for answers yet, but those are kind of opening questions. We have been looking at the life of King David, and uh, he was a great king over Israel. At one point in his life, he said, I shall never be moved. I shall never be moved. And that can be explained by thinking of his prosperity. When he saw how rich he was, how his military victories and the strength of his army had gotten him many victories over his enemies, David said, I shall never be moved. You hear his pride? Now, I don't want you to make any connections, uh, but I think you will make connections inevitably to people that you know or people that you know about. David apparently had ascribed all of his victories to his capable government and his administration and his strong armies, even though he knew better. He did know better. He had forgotten that only with the Lord was he able to defeat those enemies. Without them, David was powerless. So after the Lord humbled David, he had to admit that these things were so. By your favor, O Lord, you made my mountain, and that means his kingdom, uh, stand strong. And then David admitted to the Lord, you hid your face. I was dismayed. I don't know how he knew that the Lord had hidden his face. I don't know whether he had some outside influence, uh, some speaking to his heart or his spirit. He doesn't explain. You hid your face and I was dismayed. I'm suggesting to you for your discussion, this sentence, pride gets in the way of giving God the glory due to him. Well, you could say that's true, but I, I want you to talk about that. How does pride get in the way of giving God the glory? <clears throat> Well, 
Well, I think when things are going good, um, we kind of slack off uh, and think that it's um, our actions that are making things going good instead of God being the guide in our life and providing us with the uh, abilities to, you know, make things go well. Uh, we just elevate ourselves above him, unfortunately. That's true. We do. Pastor um, Larson, Christine here. Okay. Uh, I know my picture's not up. Um, I think it's because people haven't reached the stage of realizing to thank God for any glory they get. And that takes a long time. Maybe it means putting down pride, which is very hard. But it, but they, they're just, they just don't think of thanking for what they have. And, and, and it was not God's will to give them what they don't have. Okay. When you, when you don't get an answer to prayer, um, and the answer turns out to be no, or not now, you might feel that God has abandoned you. Mm. Anybody remember what James says? You don't have what you ask for because you ask to spend it on your own desires. Not asking if the Lord will. You read James chapter 4. Uh, and you're going to get a lot of information and direction from the Lord through the, uh, the, the Lord's brother, James. All right, shall we go on? Let's try to get that over there again. Why can't I move it over there? So pride can hinder our prayers, all right? Pride can hinder our prayers. Now everybody goes away. Unless we give God the glory for all we are and all we have, we can be led into a sense of self-security, self-security, mm -hmm. rather than acknowledge that without God, we can accomplish no good thing. Everybody agree that's true? Yeah. Yes. 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 Okay. <laughs> I wasn't really asking for a vote. Now, I want to ask you a question because I can't see what you see. Are the pictures now obscuring the sentence on the screen? Just a little bit. Just a letter or two. Okay. So we're okay. Well, all right. I'm okay. I'm okay too, yeah. Okay, we can do it that way. For the Lord God is a sun and shield. The Lord bestows favor and honor. No good thing does he withhold from those who walk uprightly. That's a quote from Psalm 84. Now, he withholds no good thing, but remember, it's the Lord who is deciding what is good for us. When you're two years old, you might want what, uh, what you see as you glide by certain items in the grocery store while you sit up there in that seat in the grocery cart. Consider today's two-year-old who wants this and that because it's sugar. Judy, did you want to add something? No, no. Um, see, if your picture comes up, I think you're saying something. Oh, no, I'm just agreeing <laughs> with you there. So here's the child reaching out for this cereal because it's full of sugar. And, uh, and the parent withholds um, that because the parent knows better. Does not the Lord, our God, our Heavenly Father, know exactly what we need at all times and for all good reasons? Yes, he does. But he, won't, he will not withhold something good from us that he knows is good. And that uprightly is our walking according to the law and we fail, and then are forgiven sinners who walk in the righteousness of Christ. So we want to talk about giving God the glory. I want to ask you, maybe I asked you last week. I don't remember. 
What does it mean to give God the glory? It means it means that you had no um, um, yourself was not involved in it, but God helped you. You had a helper, and God was the helper. Maybe I could say it that way. God is my helper, right? So, what does He deserve? Praise and glory. <laughs> And then we're going to ask you another question that not to answer now, but to think about what is the glory of God? Yeah. Mm. What is the glory of God? You've probably yourself or, you know, people who have uh, prayed uh, will ask you these things and will give you the glory. And then they pray in Jesus name. Amen. And you wonder, what, what are you talking about? Can we, to, oh, did you want that answered or are sure. we just uh, absolutely okay? To me, the glory is, is uh, the glory of God is perfection. Um, he's just perfect in everything he does. All right. And, and Good. so we give praise for that. Right. Uh, he does he does no wrong. So whatever it is, he gives us, it's the right thing from God's perspective. Okay, anyone else? What does it mean to give God the glory? I think it means love. All right, that's one of the attributes of God that we yeah. remember, especially when we pray. More? I think in today's nomenclature, we would say maybe respect. Uh, that's a yeah. key word that we don't always give to each other which, which we should, and we certainly don't always give that to God that we. Yep. Okay. Well, I want to talk about the negative first. Sometimes you define something by what it is not, all right? When we do not give God the glory, then the flesh and the world and the devil combine and force against our spiritual nature, which has been redeemed and restored by Christ. Those are our enemies, our own flesh. And then the world with all of its temptations and the devil with all of his knowledge of what, would, what our weaknesses are, they combine against us. And we can't fight these alone when we do not give God the glory. And what's the danger in that? Well, I become my own God. Let me try to put a voice tone onto this. I accomplish this great thing. I am pleased with myself. Others ought to be pleased as well. I think I will publish my winnings or my accomplishments or my victory. I'm going to tell the world how great I am. Well, what's that? Yeah. Pride. Yes, it is. Yes, yeah, it goes back to pride. I'm taking the glory. Mm -hmm. When we do not give God the glory, what does that mean? Here's a sentence, a couple of verses from Jeremiah 13. Could I have a volunteer by the name of Judy to read this, please? Sure. Hear and give ear, be not proud, for the Lord has spoken. Give glory to the Lord your God before he brings darkness, before your feet stumble on the twilight mountains. And while you look for light, he turns it into gloom and makes it deep darkness. Be not proud. Mm. Give glory to the Lord your God. And then there's this warning. Because if you don't, he's going to bring darkness and you're, you're going to stumble. And you're going to be looking for light as you go. Uh, um, you know, if you climb mountains, you're going to stumble over stones you can't see in the gloom and the darkness. It's a metaphor for living life without God, even though you know that God is at your right hand.
I would gather Jeremiah 13 is not a familiar chapter to you. He's speaking, the, the prophet is, to the nation Israel. When we do not give God the glory, what does it mean? Now here's another passage. So who is reading today? Is Evelyn reading? And did she leave us? I don't see, yeah, Evelyn, I, you're, you're muted, Evelyn. We don't hear you. Pastor, I can read if you want. No, I want to see what's wrong. Uh, I, I'm grateful for your volunteer, but I want to see if we can help Evelyn with her microphone. It may, it's not muted. It may be your microphone. There, no, there. She should be able to read. Go ahead, Evelyn. It's not muted. It's you have to turn your volume up. It's way up. Well. Oh, uh, let's see. Evelyn, uh, I'm going to ask you to go ahead and work on that. And uh, I don't know what to do. View options. Dave, would you read that, please? Now Herod was angry with the people of Tyre and Sidon, and they came to him with one accord, and having persuaded Blastus, the king's chamberlain, they asked for peace, because their country depended on the king's country for food. On an appointed day, Herod put on his royal robes, took his seat upon the throne, and delivered an oration to them. And the people were shouting, The voice of a god and not of a man. Immediately an angel of the Lord struck him down, because he did not give God the glory, and he was eaten by worms and breathed his last. Well, Be careful. Uh, yeah. that, that is an uh, awful, awful thing to happen. And it gives us a, a, a warning of... Uh, uh, that's, uh, <laughs> I'll bet you weren't familiar with that passage either. Am I on yet? No. Evelyn, you're on, but really uh, low in volume. I'm sorry about that. You were working very well last week. I don't know how to raise the, I don't know how to raise the volume. My, my, Okay. There's no, there's... We're going to ask. Uh, maybe later on, Bobby can come and uh, help you by phone to talk about how to fix that. I can't do it. I can't do that now. I'm sorry. Give God the glory. So let's turn around and talk about the positive side of giving God the glory. The glory of God can be defined by thinking of um, a sum total of all these things, the attributes of God, his majesty and his power and his dominion and his greatness and splendor and compassion and love and forgiveness. And I run out of breath long before I run out of the list of the attributes of God which have been revealed to us in the Bible. You could, you could list more of them, couldn't you? God is therefore worthy, that, that worth word, he is worthy to be held in honor by all, by all people. All people should give all worship and praise to God and to God alone. To God alone be the glory. Many songs and hymns and spiritual songs have been written with that as the major theme, give God the glory. To give God the glory is simply to acknowledge the sum total of this truth and to live and to worship and to praise and to pray accordingly. We have to bow before him. And it's the posture of the heart, I always say, not just the posture of the body. Would you like to comment on this idea of the glory of God, people? Consider the sunrise, the start of a new day, 
the light and then the little bit of orange and then the rays begin to escape from the edge of the horizon and pretty soon there's this big orange ball full of fire and power and might and that is nothing but a tiny tiny part of the glory of God shown in his creation. What? Poets have tried uh, to add to the glory of God by making adjectives and adverbs you know, cascade one upon the other. But they can't, they can't accomplish it. The glory of God can't be contained in a sentence. It's not something you can put in a definition, but it's there. So when we don't acknowledge God as the giver, if we believe that we have accomplished this or that all by ourselves, we might be led into what we are calling the security of our own flesh. Bad news. Yes? I, I said, I don't know, you might have heard, I said, bad. that's bad news. <laughs> Been there and done that. <laughs> There is a, a pronoun, and what is it? When. The pronoun that stands for our own flesh is I. Oh, I. Okay. Oh. Yeah. As someone has pointed out, it's the middle letter in the word pride. Ah. Oh, interesting. Like David, we might boast and exult over what our hands have made. Have you made anything recently? <laughs> okay. I'm not trying to trap you. I just, you don't have to tell us. Have you Chocolate made something? cookies? <laughs> yep. Have you made something and stepped back and you take a good look at it? Quilts? And look what my hands have made. Briefly, I'll, I'll share something I made a year and a half ago. Uh, I, I made a plant shelf for my wife, made out of cedar wood. And the shelves were, are made out of uh, ceramic tile, six inches by 24 inches. Okay. It's gonna last a long time. It's gonna outlast those old rusty things they're gone, I think. I could boast, I did, I boasted of what I had made. <laughs> Would you share a time when you boasted about something you have done or made or accomplished? Um, Chris here, yes. I was, I was, I probably boasted about it because I worked for seven years to get a, a third bachelor's degree in art history and that was three years ago and I I was 74 and I I thought it was an accomplishment and I know the Lord helped me because no way could I have gotten through all the stuff I had to do to get that degree and I remember being on a cruise and boasting about it and this woman and man didn't believe I really did it you know and I was like indignant you know, what do you mean? I didn't, I have a picture here. Well, that doesn't look like you. And that put me down enough to realize I should stop that. Don't even bother. <laughs> um, so yeah, that was eye opening. But I, I did it for myself, really, you know, to learn more about life. But um, it did uh, make me realize people don't care. But the Lord does, and he helped me get through it. Anybody else want to share a time when you boasted about something you've made or done or accomplished? Yeah, Pastor, I can tell you all that part of my testimony in my life is a point in time or many years where I was not walking with my eyes focused on the Lord. And I can remember very clearly standing on the front porch of my house, looking mm -hmm. at my two cars in the driveway, <laughs> thinking, look what I've accomplished. 
Um, I, I'll never forget it. I can see the whole thing again and again, but I also can't forget that shortly after that is when the Lord cleared the table and said, it's time for you and I to get this relationship in the right order. But yeah, I remember that very clearly. Hmm. Wow. Yeah, we have a, a, about a quarter acre here at this corner. And um, I, I sometimes am just too proud about what I've got. Oh. I have nothing. As I like to say, and I really do believe that the third name on our deed is the Lord. Yes. Mm -hmm. And our names are just down there as a temporary residents. Yeah. And everything in this house and everything round about this house, I say to you what you want to say to me, it belongs to God. He mm -hmm. gave it. I get to use it. This pride is what gets in the way of our prayers. That's what I'm trying to teach this morning to myself and to you. Mm -hmm. Shall we go on? When I believe I have done this great thing by myself, why pray? Mm -hmm. Who needs God when you've accomplished it? Read Ecclesiastes if you want to be humbled. I want you to read Proverbs 30, 6, 7 to 9. Who hasn't read yet today? Okay, I will. Two things I ask of you. Deny them not to me before I die. Remove far from me falsehood and lying. Give me neither poverty nor riches. Feed me with the food that I need for, that is needful for me. Lest I be full and deny you and say, who is the Lord? Or lest I be poor and and steal and profane the name of God. That's all I. I like to say that this is why God loves the middle class. <laughs> That's not exactly what it's saying, but here is the the, the prayer of Agur A G U R. I don't know him very well. He is not described in the Bible, but he has this prayer. Don't let me be poor or rich. The next sentence in verse 8, feed me with the food. That's the same as give me today the, day, the bread I need for today, mm -hmm. which is a literal translation of give us today our daily bread. I don't need tomorrow's bread. I only need it to, what I need for today. But you've got enough uh, calcium propionate in the bread that it'll keep it fresh for two weeks. Uh, if I'm full, I deny the Lord. And, and I've got my bread if I don't acknowledge that it comes from him. Does this proverb passage uh, teach you a lot about how to live? There's a humility that comes from reading the Proverbs when you realize you're not all that smart. I would like to go back to Judy if you're willing to take a deep breath and read. Sure. <laughs> I have a long passage for you and you can okay. read as much as you want. Okay. Two slides. Okay. And you shall eat and be full and you shall bless the Lord your God for the good land he has given you. Take care lest you forget the Lord your God by not keeping his commandments and his rules and his statutes, which I command you today, lest when you have eaten and are full and have built good houses and live in them, and when your herds and flocks multiply and your silver and gold is multiplied and, and all that you have is multiplied, then your heart be lifted up and you forget the Lord your God, 
who brought you out of the land of Egypt, out of the house of slavery. Lest you forget the Lord your God, who led you through the great and terrifying wilderness, when its fiery serpents and scorpions and thirsty ground where there was no water, who brought you water out of the flinty rock, who fed you in the wilderness with manna that your fathers did not know, that he might humble you and test you to do you, to do you good in the end. Beware lest you say in your heart, my power and the might of my hand have gotten me this wealth. You shall remember the Lord your God, for it is he who gives you power to get wealth, that he may confirm his covenant that he swore to your fathers as it is this day. Quite a bit of teaching mm. in those verses from Deuteronomy 8. This he spoke through Moses to the people. Did they forget? Yes. And what happened? They, they were humbled by the Lord. Mm -hmm. The Lord has a way of getting through to us because he does not want us to perish along the way. The water that came out of your faucets this morning for the many uses that you had it came from the Lord. I know a lot of people he, he used in order to accomplish that. I knew a man who worked for the water department of West Palm Beach, and he, he worked very hard to keep that water up to the standards that uh, the government had placed upon the city of West Palm Beach and all the other cities of the United States. Uh, it is very complicated in order to bring water to your faucet. All Moses had to do was strike the rock with his staff and water for all those people came gushing out. There, there is no way they could have said, we did this. They were in awe of God's power. Don't forget that it is the Lord who gives you power to get wealth. And if you lose your wealth, what then? You still have your daily bread, your life, your forgiveness. You still have the Lord by your side. And what if he should take everything from you in a terrible storm in Iowa? Yeah, Bobby, remembering he yeah. or, uh, or a hurricane or a hurricane. Mm -hmm. And you know how quickly that can happen. Mm -hmm. Don't forget that the Lord gave and the Lord took away. And you remember Job? Job. Maybe I'm dwelling on this too long, but if we don't remember the Lord to give him glory for all he has given us. I didn't finish that sentence intentionally. So I'm saying to you today that one of the hindrances to our prayers is our own pride. What happens when we get so satisfied with our own great works and our possessions? Well, we feel we don't need the Lord as much. Yeah, exactly. Well, we also get so busy taking care of them and uh, <laughs> we lose our priorities um, in our daily life. You know, Christ may have been at the top of the list when we were, when we were at our lowest in the valley and we prayed a lot, but as he brought us out of the valley and back on the mountaintop, then unfortunately prayer reversed and got put at the bottom of the list. And if that's at the bottom of your day, many times it probably just falls off the list as you fall asleep and you don't even remember to pray.
I want to put in here that prayer is not a, so much a, of a duty as a privilege. Mm -hmm. Oh, I have to pray. <clears throat> Don't think you want to start your prayer with that, uh, that weight hanging over you. How about, I want to pray. I, I can't wait. I, I really need, I'm, I'm looking forward to a time when I can pray to God and talk to him about these things that are bothering me. We get so preoccupied with our things. The danger is that we forget God and think that we've accomplished all we have done with our own intelligence and our effort and our persistence. Now, wait a minute. You, you have intelligence, right? <laughs> you do put forward a lot of effort. And in order to get something done, sometimes that you have to persist in it. You have to do it minute after minute and hour after hour and even day after day to get it done. If you have tile and there's grout in the kitchen and the grout gets dirty. <laughs> now, I know about that because I've watched Jeannie do the cleaning. <laughs> I'm looking for an easier way. I'm not talking that, that she takes pride in it, but she would like to make it look better. Jeannie always gets into the Bible study once every, every time we are get together. Here's a proverb. It's one of the earliest Bible passages that I ever memorized. Yes. Would you read it, uh, Chris? Oh, sure. Pride goeth before destruction, and a haughty spirit before downfall. Proverbs 16, number 18. Pride, 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 pride. Now, I know another use of the word pride. To be glad at heart at what God has enabled you to accomplish. Yes. My father was able to do woodworking when there was real woodwork in the older homes of Chicago and do a very exacting job. He was a perfectionist. And I want to say he took pride in his work. I don't think there's anything wrong with working to, to make a quality product or uh, working to, uh, to write a, a quality piece of prose for someone's reading. We're talking about the pride that puts God out of the picture. And that's the kind of pride that goes before destruction. I'll give you another example. I was learning how to type in 10th grade. And I didn't want to take typing because I didn't think I could compete with the girls who could type 60 words a minute. So I just took a private course with a book that I took one page at a time and I typed it. And I, I got really good. And I was typing this long passage and I was filling the paper uh, with no errors, and I was so proud of the fact that I hadn't committed a single error on this book. Oh, I just ruined it. <laughs> and I remembered the proverb. <laughs> That's a really old, old example. Looking at that passage again, pride goeth before destruction and an haughty spirit before a fall. This word haughty, we used to know what haughty meant. Yes. That's what it means from the dictionary. Proud, arrogant, conceited, self-important, puffed up, overconfident, and high and mighty. What does the Lord Jesus say about such pride? Do you know? Our 
I think you know, you just haven't remembered right at this moment. Oh, such pride is, a, is basically a sin when it's used in that manner. It condemns a man. It comes out of the heart. Uh-huh. Can you give me a quote from the Bible, from the uh, Gospels? Lead not into your own, uh, the rest of that, lead not into your own understanding. You're, you're in Proverbs 3. Whatever. <laughs> okay. And what is Lord? The Lord? And lean not on your own understanding. Acknowledge him in all your ways and he will keep your path straight. Yeah. You're in Proverbs 3. But in a way, uh, Jesus is quoting that. But he's paraphrasing it. Mm -hmm. Here it is. Mm. Read it. Uh, whoever exalts himself will be humbled. And whoever humbles himself will be exalted. Matthew 23, 12. Well, that's the, that's the law of, of life before God. You can preach 20 sermons just on that verse. Wow. Pastor, Proverbs... Uh... 11, 11 2, when pride comes, then comes disgrace, but with the wisdom is wisdom, but the, with the humble is wisdom. Just say again. When pride comes, then comes disgrace, but with the humble is wisdom. Proverbs 11, verse 2. Thank you for that. Mm -hmm. So if you did a concordance study of these words, uh, about exalting and humble, you'd come up with another dozen or two, I am sure. Peter had to find out that uh, the hard way. Yeah. After the Lord humbles us, we have to admit that this is true, that the Lord at times has to resort, like a wonderful parent that he is, to corrections and rebukes and chastisements against us. I said against us. Maybe you'd like to use a different word there in order to catch our attention and humble us. Did you ever have a father or mother that says, stop right there? <laughs> and they said it in a voice that made you stop immediately what you were doing. The Lord does not want us to go astray. And when we're so close to the precipice of falling, he can do nothing else but reach out and grab us and say, stop right there. I'm saving you, though you didn't even know that you were in trouble. Yeah. I was reading a, a psalm the other day. I can't remember the number. I'm in the, I'm in the 30s. Uh, the, and every, uh, every other verse is the Lord sees, the Lord knows. The Lord looks down from heaven and sees what we're doing. And I was remembering the hit song that was going on the radio every day, every day, every day, many times a day. And the name of the song was, The Lord is Watching Us. from a distance. Maybe yeah. you remember that. And when he does that for us, maybe instead of against us, we soon must sense what the Lord is trying to teach us. Think for a moment about your experiences with the Lord's work of humbling you. And if you'd like, uh, I would love it for you to, to share that with us. Anybody? <clears throat> Can 
Can you remember an experience in your life that you're willing to share uh, where you knew God was humbling you? Well, I can think of one going all the way back to the age of 13. Um, because it's, it has stuck in my mind all these many, many years uh, of, um, of um, dishonoring my father by sassing him in front of two of my cousins um, when we were so-called playing together and we weren't supposed to be doing something. And I was trying to um, uh, elevate my status and, of course, let him know that I could do elsewise and uh, kind of sassed him back. And I could always outrun him uh, back in those days. But um, I thought when he, I saw he was going to give me a spanking, which was the last spanking I ever had at age 13, was uh, I took off and started running thinking I could outrun him. And I even hurdled the barbed wire fence we had out by our apple orchard out there. And uh, by golly, he was really mad because he caught up with me and he spanked me in front of my two cousins, which were about my same age. And I was so embarrassed and so humbled. Yeah. And I don't think I ever sassed him again, um, you know, to this day uh, when he was living, whenever, you know, we were in their house, it was honor thy mother and thy father and do what the rules in their house are. Um, that was a humbling lesson for me. Thank you for sharing. Mm. No. Okay. I, I think um, when we lose someone we love, in many cases, a number of us are widows here and widowers or whatever, that we are humbled because it's something we can't control and it happened and, and I think that humbles us as human beings to know that we are not um, I don't know what we're not but you know something like that not self-sufficient yes right and if one does not repent Isaiah 59 Evelyn, do you want to try your microphone again? Um, it's, oh, it's on. Am I on? It's The light is on. Go ahead. Behold, the Lord's hand is not shortened that it cannot save, or his ear dull that it cannot hear. But your inquiries have made it a separation between you and your God. Your iniquities have made a separation between you and your God. And your sins have hidden his face from you, so that he does not hear. Ouch. Ouch. Yeah. Mm. Now, I want to have you note that this was spoken by Isaiah the prophet against an unrepentant people. I am, I am sure that none of those here in our class today, and none of you are unrepentant. But you know what? Uh, some of the people who watch this later may have, be having a, a bit of a problem uh, in, their, in their sin life. So one of the hindrances to prayer is, is unrepentant sin. I'm not going to dwell on that. I want to dwell on this blessing which should close out our time together. And this is what uh, the pastor says at the end of the worship service. Oh, somewhere around um, 9.30 or 9.20 on Sunday morning. Mm -hmm. The Lord spoke to Moses saying, speak to Aaron and his sons and saying, Thus you shall bless the people of Israel. You shall say to them, The Lord bless you and keep you. 
The Lord make his face to shine upon you and be gracious to you. The Lord lift up his countenance upon you and give you peace. So shall they put my name upon the people of Israel, and I will bless them. Amen. My Amen. people uh, in the Bible class and the people who are watching later on, the Lord has blessed you, and he has opened his ears to your prayers. And he wants to hear you pray to him with praises that are due to him because of his great glory, and also prayers for those you know who are hurting, who need help, that the Lord is anxious and waiting with open ears and open arms, open ears to hear you pray, and open arms to embrace you and bless you in this way to make his face shine upon you and be gracious to you as he is today. It is all because of Jesus Christ. He is the one God sent into the world to make atonement for our sins that stood between us and the Lord and he wiped it away with an awful death and conquered death in his wonderful resurrection. And then he left you this wonderful inheritance gave you the Holy Spirit as a down payment on your inheritance he fashioned you and he made you as you are and he said I love you with an everlasting love and I'm never going to leave you and I'm never going to forsake you I love to hear you pray that's what the Lord says may he bless you in this day and in this week through Jesus Christ I, I pray Amen mm -hmm.